Good morning and welcome to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. My name is Keaton Shaw and we're very happy that you're joining us once more as we continue to discuss the latest happenings here in our beloved island, the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, uh, this entire week we focused uh, mainly on crime as well as the police service and national security. This morning, we will be continuing that discussion from a different angle. We will examine the response from the minister in the office of the prime minister with responsibility over gender and child affairs, that is Ayanna Webster Roy, in relation to the report, the Justice Judith Jones report on abuse faced in childcare homes across Trinidad and Tobago, and claims that the children's authority failed to act upon the report. Now, we will also continue the discussions on crime and murders here in Trinidad and Tobago. There have been uh, five murders within the last 24 hours. The murder toll now stands at 193. 193 murders. And the fifth month of 2022 just begun. And that's where we're at. So why even bother to stop now? Nothing is being said, nothing is being done. And therefore, we think it is crucial and critical that we continue to debate exactly where we are at with national security, if that exists at all. We also want to discuss the Minister of Public Utilities in relation to uh, information that he has shared with us on government spending money on water and electricity grants. So hopefully we'll get all that done with us because we do have somebody joining us at around half past eight this morning who is eager and has been eager to speak about the crime situation here in Trinidad and Tobago. Alongside me this morning, as always, is my co-host, colleague and good friend, the ever-reliable Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keaton. And it's actually interesting to me because um, at a previous job, I took note of the amount of crime reporting at the heights almost with, um, I believe it was Shannon Banfield, that period of time, crime dominated the newspapers and now I'm wondering if you know after a lull when the murder rate did not necessarily go down mind you but after a lull now it seems as though the, the crime situation in the country is again unavoidable now here's the unfortunate correlation I believe when we had those high profile murders you know um Sharon Manfield, uh, the murder of the Japanese panist um, during Carnival. Um, we had an acting commission of police. We had a, a police command structure that was very much up in the air. And we had a police service that wasn't necessarily, didn't seem to be doing much with regards to moving forward. We didn't necessarily get a lot from the political class on the matter. And now I, I, I do have to wonder if there's correlation, which does not necessarily mean causation, between the fact that we also now have issues with a lack of enough bodies, at the very least. If you don't want to judge um, Deputy Commissioner of Police acting as Commissioner of Police now, McDonald Jacobs, at the very least, he is one man when they're supposed to be, I believe, uh, a substantial commissioner and three to four deputy commissioners. Right? There's, there's a lack of um, leadership at the top, just bodies to fill those posts. And I wonder to what extent it affects direction. It affects long-term planning. It directs, it directs goal setting. Um, and then on, from that trickles down to day-to-day -day operations and how effective they could be. So these are unfortunate times because I guess you could... I have said it, so I can't go back on it now. The economic situation, again, is pushing people to do more and more crazy things. And, we, and some of the crimes seem a little bit crazy. They, um, we just spoke about um, stealing electrical cable. Well, Port of Spain General reports telecommunication wires stolen, um, $43,000 worth from one room in Port of Spain. Apparently, how? three reports. I don't know how you get $43,000 worth of cable in one room. but even possible? Forget Forget the cost associated. It could have been a storage room. The, this is the thing. Forget the cost associated. Uh, because that's secondary, in my opinion, at this point. It's, it's just how in a public hospital, and this may be a stupid question to some of those who are viewing this morning, considering the state 
of our public hospitals, as well as the security in our public hospitals. But just exactly how do you walk out with $43,000 of cables? You look, you look as though you are supposed to be walking out with $43,000 worth of cables. How many people will question you? <laughs> well, that, that in itself is brilliant. Because the flip side is, to what extent do we... There, there's, you could speculate further with regards to how um, people might not be diligent at their jobs in the hospital. That could have caused the issue. It could have been an inside job. That could have caused the issue. Or it could have been just a, a, a really, really smart moment of opportunity crime. We don't know. So speculating at this point doesn't matter. What I will say is this. At the end of the day, someone felt it necessary to try to steal... 43,000 worth of cable from uh, um, armored cables in the radiology department. I just... Who's purchasing, I just, who's purchasing Right, cables? that's what I do. Like, that's my question. Where, one more where, time. Where, who's going to fence these things? Are you selling them to some other island or other country maybe? But then to go through that amount of trouble? Well, bear in mind, the um, Scrap Iron Dealers Association indicated that they were pulling, willing to pay TSTT in US dollars in order right, to receive. Right, so it's to, probably to going receive. to be scrap. Yeah. Right? Right now, and, and, and again, we're not, we're not saying it definitely is, and we need to lock up the, the scrap iron dealers, but we are saying that, you know, it help yourself. At the end of the day, I say this to somebody government all the time. They, they seem to not understand the benefits to them and their political careers for transparency. It, it gets questions that you probably don't, in don't, don't this, need to be pointed at you. In this particular instance, in relation to... Well, the scrap the ideas, scrap we're, ideas. We're, we're transparent and, 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 and explained everything. You know, then we could eliminate them from being potential collaborators and their members. I think the issue is that many a times, if we were trying to be fair, I think uh, the... the people, associations, organizations, uh, unions who are uh, calling the government to be transparent, calling the government to, to come out and, and act with integrity and speak with integrity, but that is not necessarily reciprocated or practiced by those who are calling for it. So that may be the case sometimes. Corruption works both ways, remember that. And I, and I think... It's not just one right. way. Right, and, and, and therein lies the problem. I think at the end of the day, this is one of the reasons why you just default to do the right thing. Because when you default to do the right thing, you don't end up with skeletons in your closet and all of a sudden you're like, I, don't, I, can't talk about, I can't talk about this, I can't talk about that because people might dig into me and find things out. Anyway, my friend, we have to move on um, to, to a very serious topic. Um, and I'm beginning with the insurance authority did not act. And I'm reading directly from a, a newspaper article. Uh, and the minister in the office of the prime minister with responsibility for gender and child affairs, Ayanna Webster Roy says... It would not be fair to say the children's authority did nothing to intervene when it was made aware of reports of abuse at children's homes. So I'm going to give you the exact quotes and then we're going to debate this a bit. And I quote, on the part of Minister Ayanna Webster-Roy, as in this newspaper article, I do not want to cast a broad brush and say the children's authority did not act. That would not be fair to the authority. That would not be fair to the persons who provide care and protection to the nation's children. What we have is legislative framework that provides avenues for us to ensure that checks and balances are in place, to ensure that regulations are followed. However, are they being fully implemented the way they should be implemented? That is something that must be answered and the report would have revealed that not all checks and balances were actually being implemented. Now, you answered your question to begin with and then it's a direct rebuttal. Your, it's a direct rebuttal to, not, to saying that we should not blame the children's authority. But continuing, in my discussions with the children's authority, a number of different reasons have come out. But as I said before, it was important for me to get to the root of it and not just say, okay, the children's authority didn't do this, the ministry didn't do that, homes didn't do this, but to understand exactly what is happening, what are the shortcomings, so we could adequately address the shortcomings. First of all, Minister Ayanna Webster, I, I appreciate you being willing to speak to the media. Um, we have not personally contacted you, but from what I understand, you're always willing and open to speak to the media. And perhaps that's something that we need to do in the program. 
But what you but, uh, what you One thing though, a lot of politicians say that they're always willing and open to speak what to the you media, and they're not. What you said here though does not make sense to me. As, as, as just reading this, it doesn't make sense. First of all, you're stating that we shouldn't blame the children's authority and say that they didn't act. But then you go on to say that there's a legislative framework that was not fully implemented, regulations weren't fully being practiced. Then you say the report indicated the shortcomings, but then you went on to say, well, I had to get to exactly what the shortcomings were. But it is indicated in the report. So this entire thing, as far as I'm concerned, is absolute fluff. And you're right. Maybe I should not blame the Churns Authority. Maybe I should blame you. The individual who holds responsibility and oversight, not only on the part of Churns Authority, but it is your duty and responsibility to not only read this report, but figure out exactly what's going on within these homes. One home in particular, which has been flagged in the report, receives roughly $75,000 a month from the government. How much money is spent on these homes? Is it that it is the duty and the responsibility of the ministry to simply provide funding and that's it? We're just gonna give you the money and that's it? That's all we're going to do? Well, therein lies the question. Who is the actual owner of the facility? Are these private facilities that contract their services to um, the government, similar to how you have private prisons in the United States, you haven't gone that these way, but are, are these homes. facilities private institutions? These are homes, some of them I don't believe they are, are fully funded by the government. There right. are some who are partially funded. In other words, we, we're given a monthly allowance or, or monthly funding on the okay. part of the government, right? That is the instance. But I am absolutely appalled because this report took five and a half months. The report itself revealed sickening details of uh, abuse, uh, uh, be it physical, uh, mental. Can I just say, I am just pleasantly surprised it only took five and a half months because in TNT, I was expecting you to say two and a half years. No. Oh, regardless of, of, of the length, the mere fact is it's been sitting on a shelf. And Minister Yana webster -Roy, if we're not going to blame the insurance authority, which, you know, what is the duties and the responsibility of the insurance authority? If we're not going to blame the insurance authority, then who is it that we hold accountable for these regulations so, not being implemented? Do we hold you accountable for ensuring that it was not the case? So, so the thing is, if the legislature hasn't been implemented, is, isn't that parliament? So what is No, the, the legislative oh, it's framework been passed, was there, yes. But it has but been implemented. Regulations right. were so, not followed. Right. So here's here's the thing. Or here's one of the things that I am concerned with. Because through my experience and speaking to people in various um, institutions, whether as employees or as people who have had to partake of the services, right? I do question the proficiency of these setups, the people involved, the people who work there, the people in charge, because the, the, the employees, you will have um, various different job types. Some will be um, counselors, psychologists, ch child, um, I mean, experts with regards to child psychology, caretakers, um, um, of course, facilities manager. And I know for a fact I have dealt with kids um, due to an organization I'm involved with. I, I'm hesitant to, to, to connect all the dots right now, but I'll just say that we have dealt with kids from various institutions. While I have not necessarily heard of anything to say that I could make an accusation of abuse, the treatment of the kids at times left a lot to be desired. So, and then we have to ask ourselves, why are we expecting good job performance from this part of the government. Because even if you're partially funded, for all intents and purposes, really and truly, where's your SE funding coming from? Are you some private entity that, that, that has some profit-making business no, elsewhere? Right. No, it's right. Through donations. It's so, through so, donations. So for all intents and purposes, you are a government or, or like entity. You are like a government entity. Where do we have, and we asked this yesterday, I believe, where, where are we seeing efficiency? Where are we seeing good job performance? Rarely and truly. So what do we expect? And I think what the minister was doing, and what she's not going to say it is, 
She's trying to figure out what wiggle room she has because she doesn't want to say, well, this is one more area of public service that is falling on its face, in part possibly because of money. Some of these things probably were not inst uh, uh, instituted because of lack of funds. Minister Ayanna Webster Roy, if you were not aware, I'm going to educate you this morning. If you go on the Children's Authority's website and you click on About Us and you go down to What We Do, according to the Children's Authority, the legislation that allows them to act in the manner in which they do or for the purpose of which they were established is, and I am now speaking directly from the Children's Authority website, receiving and investigating reports of mistreatment of children making applications to the court for the protection and placement of children received into the care of the authority, establishing and maintaining places of safety, assessment and support centers, and reception centers, establishing standards for community residences, foster cares, and nurseries, monitoring children's community residences, foster care providers, and nurseries, issuing and revoking license for community residents and nurseries, Supporting the youth justice system, maintaining complete records. Minister Ayanna Webster Roy, your argument is null and void, and you have failed the children in these homes in your duty as minister. I mean, I can only hope, I can only hope that with this 13, this 13 member task force that has been established to ensure that all the recommendations made in the reports will vindicate your arguments. But as quoted from Hanif Benjamin, who is the former chairman of the Children's Authority, lives were lost. Is it too late? So now what we're doing is that we're acting to ensure that this does not happen in the future. But what happens to those children whose lives were lost? So they will just be forgotten. Here's the bad news. I do have to wonder to what extent lives have been lost year after year in various means. It didn't have to just be child abuse leading to um, their untimely deaths, but rather their development gets affected in such a way that instead of growing up to be contributing members of society, they grow up and add to our criminal problem and while it doesn't necessarily excuse them or give them a, a get-out-of-jail-free card, what it does show is that we are the makers or at least contributors to our own problems, right? It's not as though everybody that's a criminal gets up on the wrong side of the bed and then all of a sudden just decides, I am going to be not law-abiding for the rest of my life. So the long-term effects, because I don't think this is, this is new. I don't think this is new. I think with regards to how these facilities, look, St. Michael's Home for Boys, and, and all of the, uh, the, 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 the drama that happened with, uh, with their closure or that closure, these things have been ongoing for years. It's just that eventually it piles up. And what is a bad situation, because it's not being run properly, gets worse over time and worse over time. And then eventually we don't have money to throw at the problem to make it go away. So what could we do? We do what the minister does. Fish for, 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 for anything to say. Use a lot of bad words. Try to avoid the issue. Because she's probably walking into something that predates her. But it's your responsibility now. As we conclude this conversation... Quoting again directly from the Children's Authority website, again, educating the minister this morning, since it seems as though she's not aware. The Children's Authority, this is now under who are we exactly, you know, who the Children's Authority are. The Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, also referred to as the Authority, is a specialized agency with the responsibility for the care and protection of children, especially those who are at risk of being victims of abuse or neglect. The authority advocates for the rights of children and encourages and supports them to enjoy their childhood. The organization's overarching objective is to utilize child-friendly and progressive solutions to address children's issues and rehabilitate them that their full potential is realized. The Children's Authority falls under the remit of the Office of the Prime Minister, Gender and Child Affairs, 
headed by the Honorable Ayanna Webster Roy. Minister Ayanna Webster Roy, you have failed unfortunately, and I don't necessarily blame the Trans Authority. I blame your oversight, because it's stated right here on the website of the Trans Authority. I only hope, again, that this 13-member task force fully implements the regulations, because if any reports come out again of this taking place, what are you going to say? What, what excuses are we going to come with now? Are we going to establish another reporting committee? Are we going to establish another task force? My dear, I wish you all the very best. I wish you the best of luck. This is a very tough pill to swallow and a very hard one to get out of. But for some reason or the other, that is always where the government has been successful in getting out of situations that they find themselves entangled into. Folks, we take a break here on Talking Point. When we return, we'll continue the discussions this morning. Stay tuned. North Coast Jazz 2022. Day two, event two. The big day is Family Saturday. Family. And the biggest stars are performing on festival grounds. Michelle Sylvester, Ruel Lynch, Patrick Gordon, Adam Hagley featuring Tony Paul, Leandra Head, Johan Chuckery, Sharon Phillips, Freetown Collective, powered by festival band Dean Williams and Company. Each master talent will perform a song from Lord Nelson's wide catalogue. Saturday, Family, May 28th. Together again, Festival Grounds, Blanchicheurs. Family, a tribute to Lord Nelson. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival 2022. Three days, three events, three experiences. Born here, played here. here. Get your tickets now at Crosby St. James, Extra Foods Arima, Sangre Grandi, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor and Chaguanas, Digicel Trin City and C3 Malls, and Digicel Head Office, 11 C Maraval, WESN 38. Gataka Street, Woodbrook, Suntix.com or call our ticket hotline at 628-5835 or 681-1516. Tune in to WESN Content Capital from May 5th to 13th as we bring you exclusive coverage of the TTCB's T20 Festival. Eight teams will face off at the Cricket Center in Balmain, Coover. Follow us for the live action only on WESN Content Capital, your home for cricket. I bought my last pair in November of 2021 and I loved everything about these glasses. I heard about Ferrera Optical Virtual Care when I posted to social media about the dogs mangling my glasses. As someone who works from home, I thought, why not give it a try? And I did. Virtual care is the opportunity for me to have a video consultation with either an optometrist or an optician for my eyewear or my eye care. I'm looking forward to most following my virtual care visit, the opportunity to choose my glasses, to have someone to personally curate the spectacles that I want. That's very exciting to me. And creamy, you'll find it right here. Makes you smile, relax a while, it's fun and good chair. Ooh, enjoy every scoop. Ooh, every taste will get you hooked. We have flavors that you love, a combination special. Come along, enjoy our treats. This is Uncle Pete's. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war and the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we 
inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The, the communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I'm tables are turned, when the tables are turned, oh. it's the same. It's the same way. Okay, this has been Ten Questions. I'm Andy Johnson, and we'll see you next time. I am Rondell Donoa, attorney at law and host of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Strictly Legal is a legal program geared towards informing you, the public, of your legal rights, responsibilities, and remedies. So be viewing Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water wars, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fixit, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sport? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing around here. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking at Interact System. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go out there and rep the red, white, and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door on. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. I Jazz 2022. You asked for it. Consider it done. Park in comfort at the Queen's Park Savannah and ride in style to festival grounds for the biggest family event. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival. Park, ride, enjoy. It's all about family. Family Saturday, May 28th. Together again. Festival grounds, Blanchishers. Family, family. A tribute to Lord Nelson. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival. Born here, played here. Get your tickets now at Crosby St. James, Extra Foods Arima, Sagby Granti, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor and Chaguanas, Digicel Trin City and C3 Malls, and Digicel Head Office, 11 C Maraval, WESN, 38 Gataka Street, Woodbrook, Suntix.com, or call our ticket hotline at 628-5835 or 681-1516. If you live with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 and has to self-isolate at home, take care of them from a distance and reduce their movement around the house. Give them space, a designated space, and open those windows. If you have to be in contact, mask up, both of you. If you work, stay home from work and don't go out not even to the grocery or pharmacy. And remember, no visitors allowed. Limit the contact to limit the spread. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Welcome back to Talking Point, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we are continuing our discussions uh, with crime here in Trinidad and Tobago. Very depressing, ladies and gentlemen. I, I don't mean to depress you, although it is not me. I'm simply reporting to you the reality of the situation here in our beloved Twin Island Republic. Ironic, isn't it? Alongside Sean Michael Small and myself this morning is uh, no stranger to the program. Somebody who has uh, been... Uh, very vocal about the latest happening here in our country. Um, very vocal in relation to the development of Port of Spain, particularly with East Port of Spain. But more so, as I mentioned, across the development of small areas in Trent Tobago, which seems to have been neglected. This morning, alongside Sean Michael Small and myself, is the former mayor of Port of Spain, Mr. Louis Lee Singh. Good morning, Mr. Lee Singh. Welcome back to the program. Good morning. Friends. Can I call you friends? You can. 
Good morning, friends. Oh, so I'm no longer comrade. Well, you no longer look like Fidel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. That answers your question. So, so folks, if the bear and, uh, returns, I could say that th this is part of the reason why. When it returns. So, Don't blame me. Mr. Lee Singh, I've witnessed this many a times walking on the street. People still refer to you as mayor. Right? People have commented and said that you are the best mayor that they've ever seen in Port of Spain. Now, I don't want to get too much into that, but you know, just, just based off of your relationship with, with the man on the street and, and, and your experiences, I mean, in assessing the current situation as to where we are right now, I, I, and you know, what's taking place is very depressing. How do you even respond to the common man when they now are absolutely frightened to, to, to even go about their daily lives? conduct their daily business? Keaton, I think Trinidad and Tobago is an unreal place. And I came across a, a quote last night which said, in a crazy world, craziness is common. So that might well apply to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Now, what is crime in that context? Crime is a condition of corruption. And if we, we, we make some loops, I always try to think in loops. What creates corruption? Contracts, gangs of all hues. You see, people, if I ask you this morning, what makes a criminal? Could you give me an answer? Can't give you a, a clear-cut answer. Anybody could be deemed could, a criminal. But could you give me a short answer? A lot of things could make a criminal. Tell us. Generally speaking, um, the obvious are bad upbringing, lack of opportunity in order to, to not get ahead, but lack of opportunity to actually just have a normal, stable life and livelihood. But there'll always be deviants who they will look to be criminals regardless because they want that type of life, whether it's the fast money, whether it's to the, the, they want to be violent. So, but for, for some, it I, is so, I so lack of I just disagree with you very so, mildly so, with, with your first part of the answer. Ethan, because I believe anybody, even if they have an underprivileged upbringing, I believe it depends on the person's mindset so, and their aspirations. So let me say to you. Underprivileged could still have opportunity. Let me, let me say to you this. I think we, every time we have a perception, you, you, every time you think about a criminal, you think about those people who you see the police bringing in in handcuffs. Fellas with plaits in the head, three quarter pants, or the pants falling off their waist with some big boots and things. But those criminals are really the products of the real criminals in the society. Yeah. The criminals that we don't see at all because they are above the law. The criminals who live in the biggest houses on the tallest hills, the criminals who sit in corporate boardrooms. Try and understand, we have been conditioned to believe a criminal is one of the little Afro-Trinidadians who live in sea lots or East Port of Spain. And that is unfortunate. We are conditioned to believe that the criminals reside on the, on the foothills of, 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 of the Diego Martin Valley. And that is unfortunate because above them, they are the real criminals. They are the ones who give out contracts. It's not only the government who gives contracts in this country. The real masterminds and gang leaders are the ones who are giving out the contracts and causing all the mayhem in the country. Crime in this country is, is as a result of corruption and money. And so until we get a fix on that and begin to understand that we have to find ways and means to stamp out corruption at all levels, to create in Trinidad and Tobago a culture of an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, I want to share with you a real experience I had some years ago. I got a call from a lady at the Young, 
the YMCA, the Young mm -hmm. Men's Christian Association. Mm -hmm. She said, Mr. Leasing, I hear you all the time talking on the radio about national service and things like that. I want you to come and talk to my boys. So in my mind, I thought I was going to talk to a normal classroom. <clears throat> when I got there the Monday morning, I met 10 young men, all Afro-Trinidadians, all between the ages of 14 and 17. All had normal names, but they all had aliases, halfers, menace, names like that. Menace subsequently died on Piccadilly Street. Mm. And I want to say to you, when I started to chat with the, 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 the young men, I realized that they didn't understand values. The concept of an honest day's work for an honest day's pay did not apply to them. In fact, when I began to discuss that, one of the guys said to me, Sir, why are you discussing that with us? We don't really have to work. If we want something, we're going down by city gate and we want something and we see somebody with it, we'll take it from them. So they didn't have to work for it, save and accept that they will put a weapon to the person and deprive them of it. The, the conversations with that group also told me that none of them had homes, family life. So at the root of Trinidad and Tobago's problems, its criminal problems, is the issue of the family. What we believe to be the family and how we set about assembling a family and protecting the family and growing the family and supporting and counseling is not a common phenomenon in many communities in Trinidad and Tobago. There was a time if you did something wrong in this country, an adult will pull you up. Adults now, and there was a time people looked out their windows, literally looked out their windows in these, in these small, difficult communities. People sat in the, inside and they looked out. And if they saw something that was amiss, they would do something about it. Mm. Now people don't even turn, turn away. They look away. They're not looking at all. They don't want to know. And so our, we have fallen so far into the muck. It is not surprising to me that the challenges that we have seem insurmountable. And that's the point I want to make. I think we are asking too much of Commissioner Jacobs too soon because he inherited a whole mess. He inherited a situation where I am not convinced, despite all the bravado of the former commissioner of police, that he did anything of a good job. I, I want to ask you, based off of what you mentioned in relation to not only the, the family setting, um, but, but speaking with the group of those 10 men. Now, you also mentioned um, many a times Afro-Trinidadians, and, and there is a perception that we must not hide from. But also adding to that, when people used to look out their window or, or, or the older generation adults would, would do something about it, they don't do it anymore. Do you think where we are now is modern society? Do you think that, that crime or criminal activity is actually a form of unification amongst misplaced individuals within society? Do you think that it unites people? Well, I, I will tell you something. As we sit here this morning, the one thing that has frightened me, and, and I truly mean frightened, is that because I'm conscious of East Port of Spain and its challenges, and East Port of Spain is no longer the geographical location here in Port of Spain, East Port of Spain now resides wherever the government has put down a residential community, La Hoquet, in, in a Central Enterprise, you name it, wherever it, is, it exists. We have, moved this, we, have, we have moved people from one area of challenge and put them in another area, and we have not, as it were, put all the support services to create communities of people. That is another story that I am not that requires a whole discussion. But I, I, I want to ask you, to, or really, really ask you, Keaton and, and, and Sean, to think about it. 
people who have nothing. What have they to lose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People who have nothing, absolutely nothing. And when I say nothing, I don't mean building and property and things like that. They don't even have self. They don't have parents too they could come home to and confide with if they have a challenge. They have no job. And we have placed them in schools and we are not catering for them because they ought to be in schools requiring remedial work. We have a scenario that has frightened me, I started to say it, where for the last two plus years, a whole group of people, thousands I, I, I want to, 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 to calculate, mm -hmm. have not gone to school, and I'm talking about the, a vulnerable group, 14 to 16, they have not gone to school because they simply had no access to devices, etc. And even if they had a, 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 a access to devices, Really, who supervised these children to, to ensure that the state did not, as it were, add to its levels of burdens? What is the Minister of Education doing to understand the nature of this problem? Does she have any programs that is, as it were, checking numbers, checking to see the extent to which people have been affected? And if so, what are the programs the government is contemplating to bridge that gap? The, we have, I, I see Mr. Cummins talking about national service, but clearly his focus, he's a good businessman, and his focus is <laughs> on rehabilitating old youth camps and what have you. Mm -hmm. So that is a question of contracts. You know, he, he, he's into construction. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. So the issue is, is he really focusing on the construction or on the programs that will serve as the bridge to bring these people into the, the, the productive mainstream of our society? Well, herein lies the problem. And if we don't do that, we could add that as an next cycle of the crime. But to me, it's almost similar to the talk about diversification. You get lip service, but it goes back to your first point. Who are the real criminals? Because it's reported now that the ATF is coming back to TNT. And that's nice. But think about it. What is one of the few things we see in the papers? Oh, well, they got these guns today. They didn't arrest anybody. They got guns. So we're getting foreign help to get more guns. But guns doesn't seem to be a problem. We don't arrest anybody in, um, in, in association with these firearms, all of these illegal firearms that are caught. And to what extent do we interdict drugs beyond marijuana? Who cares if we interdict hundreds of pounds of marijuana? How, how much it, cocaine it, do we stop? So notice, they brought in the ATF, right? It seems as though the corruption and the crime bosses and the people behind the scenes don't, don't care about how much guns that we pick, pick off the streets. But we didn't bring any DEA. And my speculation is what matters to them is that the drugs must flow. So, so yeah, bring the ATF and it will look nice to the people. But don't, don't do anything to disrupt the drug um, supply chain that runs through this country. Now, do, you, do you think, uh, with, with that, uh, and, and let me ask you honestly, uh, based off of everything that you said, do you think that without the drug trade in Trinidad and Tobago, our economy would collapse? L let's be real a second. Because, because we're hearing about so many well, individuals well, involved well, and well, so many I, people I, living because I of that. I would not say that. And, and the, the reality is, guys, let's, let's be honest about it. Trinidad is not in, 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 in the worst place. Trinidad might be in a difficult place. The point is, this country, based on my last observation, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm deliberately not following figures and things these days mm -hmm. because I'm a much more pragmatic man. I think Trinidad and Tobago collects approximately $37 billion in taxes. Mm -hmm. In taxes in this country. If I were the, the prime minister of this country, I could run Trinidad and Tobago on $37 billion. Because I would put the nation back to work with that $37 billion. I would get people involved. You see this issue with the homes? Mm -hmm. We've just put the homes in the hands of the wrong people. 
homes and children and schools should be the responsibilities of parent teachers associations working in concert with tutor and, and, and teaching institutions. So that if I had to ho set up a, ho a, a after school network of programs, it would be the PTA in the school working with the teachers in the school to make it happen. I as the state would pay for the children, but I want proper reporting. I want to see how many children attended. But more importantly, I want to see the growth patterns of my children. Everything must be tied to improvement in the society. That is not now happening. And I don't want us to deviate from the crime because I think that is criminal too. In the context of crime in Trinidad, and I thought this is where you were going just now, Sean, we have a situation where we're getting people and we're bringing them to court. Mm -hmm. But that is where it ends. They go to court for the first time and we don't hear about well, the matter for the next 20 years and then you hear the matter suddenly, suddenly out of the court. Well, yes, you have that. But again, remember your first point. Let's not be too necessarily caught up on the, on, on, on the low-hanging fruit, on, on the typical lowest guy on the totem pole. To me, rarely to solve this issue. Yes, social programs are needed for those who kind of end up in a life of crime because they don't know better, like, like the young men who you spoke to, right? They don't have values. They don't have that in place. They're set up for failure. But part of that setup, part of the system that sets it up, is the corruption that keeps the crime going, that says, hey, look, I have something for you. I have an opportunity for you. The problem is it's a false opportunity. As one of the guests for one of our other shows psyched, um, the gentleman who was in prison for 20 years, he said, at the end of the day, the bosses don't care about you. They stop supporting you. They don't do anything for your family once you're in, in prison. These young men don't necessarily understand. But the best part is the ones who don't have a family, well, they're expendable. They have no one to advocate for them. They have no one to stand up for them. No, they have no one to miss them or support them. You're alluding to white collar crime. And I think no, Louis, no, 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 hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. And I think Louis also alluded no, to this. No, 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 no. It's not white collar crime. Hold on, Peter. hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about your second point. I'm talking about your first point. Because I think also you spoke about this at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. White collar crime is essentially at the top of the pyramid and it trickles down, no. which allows for other criminals. No, no. Say, say, say no. Drugs, drugs at the top of the pyramid. So where we where and it, they trickle so, down. So, so the point is this: Do we classify drugs as being the, the, the thing the the, 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 the the crime of the white collar criminal, or do we classify drugs as being a, the responsibility of the criminals. Criminals. All right. So that the point I think we need to clarify is that drugs is driven by criminals at all levels of the society. But the people who really control it are at the top of our at society. At the top. Right? Now, let me say this to you all. Trinidad will never become get on top of its crime until people begin to pay for crimes. Nobody is held accountable in a real, timely way for criminal well, actions in this country. Please, pause a minute. Stick it. Hold your thoughts. We have a situation where, for example, the Dana Sita Hall matter. <laughs> yeah. Why is that not resolved? The Marlene McDonald matter, given all the overwhelming evidence, why isn't that now in and out of the courts? If it is to set Ms. McDonald free, please set her free. But don't keep it dragging on. My position is this, that despite all the evidence, Ms. McDonald may be, may be set free. And if that is so, set her free so that she could go ahead and have her life. That's how I feel about, about crime in this country. And the question is, we talk about the, the different branches of the, of the exec of the, of the um, government. Of government and that the judiciary must remain free. A judiciary that is functioning alive and well should remain free. 
Mm -hmm. But the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, and I understand that the Chief Justice was just given an additional five years. Which I can't understand for the life But no, of let's not get into that. But my own position is this. To what extent does the Prime Minister sit with the Chief Justice and inquire, why aren't we doing better? Mm -hmm. Because if I listen to the, the judges, I often hear a judge or two commenting on the, on the, on the level of administration of the, of the judiciary. If the judiciary cannot be treating with matters, and, 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 and that goes all the way to the magistrate courts, eh? mm -hmm. because you go to, if any day I will take you all down to the magistrate courts, and you always sit down and you will count, we will count after the day's sitting how many matters have just been adjourned. They come, so and so. Well, the police are not here. Adjourned to the so and so and so. Well, so and so. Um, my client is unable to come to court, sir, and we ask for an adjournment. Adjourned. Everything is adjourned. We have got to take a position that every matter that is, that is brought before the court must be settled within 30 days. I am saying to you, if Trinidad and Tobago does not move to the stage where we begin to deal with our fundamental problems, the society will erode into revolution. But well, we're seeing a form of that taking place already, a, a, a slight form of revolution if we want to talk about vigilante justice. Isn't that the case? Well, just vigilante justice and revolution are two totally different things. But those of us who have grown up following the history of what has often been described as the third world will tell you that when things cannot work in a society, the people often find their own solutions to the problems mm -hmm. that they can work. Yeah. And I think I told you all the story of Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rollins in Ghana yeah. at an earlier time. Yeah. yeah, well, here's the thing, though. As much as, yes, I agree the judiciary is a problem, and I am an advocate of social programs, I had Giselle Chance on Talking Points, I think, almost a year ago at this mm -hmm. point. Ultimately, I think it comes down to what Karen always says. What are we doing, not just about drugs? That is the revenue stream that finances a lot of the corruption, that keeps the criminal underworld going. If, they, if you don't have the money, then the, 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 it's not as advantageous. It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same allure to the people. But most importantly, how could anybody be taken seriously when they say, we are going to clean up crime and we have not had a drug lord or a crime boss arrested, not even charged and got off, even to just say that we arrested them? Sean. Sure. We suspected them of something. We have not had that for 20 years. Answer this. We, we've had indications that this individual, Sandman, he was a drug lord. We, we, were, we were told that uh, uh, Berkey was a drug lord. Um, all these individuals were drug yes, lords. Yes, they end up in President's house. Who really, to, to, to try and answer your question and put it in context, who really are the drug lords? And if, and if it is, we can answer that question, and we are aware of that. Why aren't they prosecuted? I know. I know because I heard it from the horse's mouth. The executive knows who the drug lords are. Yes. And why aren't they prosecuted? Right? I don't know. Because she, she, right? Ke Keaton, corruption for one, Keaton, corruption me, for let, one. Let me say to you, two things are running in this, that two things drive this country. Fear. Fear another, yes. And fear. So that... Everyone takes the cue from what has happened to Dana Sitahal. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this is all the more reason why, regardless of whatever happened, if the society wanted to turn to a better space, the matter should have been long concluded. The issue of political corruption has been something we have talked about, and people have, from time immemorial, from Williams days, lock joint, um, gas station racket, but nothing has happened. And it continues unabated. My thing is this, with Dana Sital's murder, are any of those men the people who actually ordered the killing? 
Well, that's the thing, no, Sean. No. We have to determine who ordered the killing. But we we right. are, we have those who are allegedly responsible for the killing. I say allegedly because who conducted, are, not responsible. Right. Okay. Who, guy. Are, who are behind bars? Um, and and there was even an issue with that in relation to their criminal records, which is why one of their cases couldn't be heard. Imagine that in this day and age. But anyway, folks, we have to break for news on the hour. And when recently we open up the phone lines this morning, stay tuned. Saturday, May 28th, the day we come together again as family. Master talent, great food, awesome vibe. Come have a good time. Family, family, a tribute to Lord Nelson. It's tradition on the island. Nowhere else that I know is like... North Coast, North Coast Jazz, born here, played here. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water wars, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fixit, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Burning questions, urgent topics. Welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think, act and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11am, only on WESN, Content Capital. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, 
and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Welcome back to Talking Point. Now, very quickly, before we open up the phone lines, uh, Mr. Lee Singh, just you had a, a couple of things you wanted to address before we... We, we were talking crime. Uh -huh. And I wanted to just put this in the context because we often hear administrations talk about building new police stations mm. and building um, and wanting more police officers. Port of Spain has, I think, 13 police stations. And for the size of Port of Spain, with a Burgess of 49,000 people, it should really be the safest city in the world. Think about it. We have a station in Marval. We have one in St. Clair. We have mm -hmm. one in Woodbrook, mm -hmm. St. James, Bessel Street, Belmont. You name it. We have police stations. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of police buildings. What we may not have is policing, which is to say a building like a school is not necessarily a police station. Yes, yeah. A school building is not a school. A hospital building is not a hospital, which is the problem in Trinidad and Tobago. We have not been able to find the resources to make that happen. Oh, the right people. But the point I really want to make is this, that when I served as mayor of Port of Spain, I was invited by the city of Boston to come to Boston because they had named a day in, in Boston, New York, Boston, USA, Mayor Louis Leasing Day in the city of Boston. It's documented, I have the certificates and what have you, photographs to testify. And I had a long audience with the police commissioner because that mattered to me. Boston has a huge population of one point something million. It's, its night population, however, reduces to about 800 plus thousand. But it has 2,000 police. How much police we have in Trinidad? More than 2,000. We have about 7,000 police officers. Very, yep. And so our question is, it isn't that we need police. What we need are reliable, dedicated, committed, disciplined, well-structured and well-organized police. And I want to believe that we should give this new man an opportunity to do that. Well, because the last fellow didn't do that. Well, hold that thought right there, because we, uh, we're going to open the phone lines now. We're going to give you the opportunity to talk to us this morning and talk to the former mayor Port of Spain. We'll have your thoughts and opinions here. 623-9376, Numbers up on your screen. We have a caller on the line with us from Tobago. Good morning, caller. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sean and Mr. Lee Singh enjoyed the conversation this morning. So much has been said. I won't be able to comment on all of them. Uh, I want to start with the minister. I believe her name is uh, Minister Dexter Roy. Oh, yeah, that was Sir Roy, yeah. It is so important that we, the people, hold those in high office accountable. Yes. They receive a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, in remittances. They, re they receive perks, mm -hmm. um, high-value positions. But it's not just for the position that that the value is attached. It's to the responsibility. The higher up you are, the more responsible you are for what happens under you, mm -hmm. right? So that when something happens that ought not to have happened under your watch, your head must roll. Your mm -hmm. head must roll as minister. The person who is responsible for children authority, their head must roll. Mm -hmm. What happens when that, ha when, when that takes place? The next people that come into that position know 
mm. that they must not go into that, that position and just pose. Mm. And when things happen, they then spin and do talks and all of these. Uh, you were reporting, Keith, kind of how the language went in and out of itself, and it just didn't make sense. They know that that's not going to fly. Yeah. They know that it's going to be short-lived, that they, their head is going to roll, and so they'll insist that things be done in a proper way. Yes. How many times has that minister, in her purview, visited those children's homes? Mm. Do a drive-by, just like the gangs do. Just do a drive-by. Yes. What they tend to do is do an announcement a couple of days before, I'm coming. So, so the people running the homes now do the clean-up. The minister is coming, let's clean up, and everyone look sharp and look like everything is normal. You see? Yeah. Don't do. Don't announce your visit. Just, just drop by. Drop by. Yeah. There's nothing to going and so forth. Yeah. So this is very, very important. The next point I want to raise, and I agree so much that Mr. Lee Singh has drove this home, and I believe that this is where we should stay. Crime begins at the top. You have crimes of opportunity that the grassroots will involve themselves in, and then you have crimes of greed. Crimes of greed feed the crimes of opportunity. Because they're the ones that provide the, mm -hmm. the, the means and the, and, and the value for people with the opportunity to go after it. Mm -hmm. So the drug dealing on the streets, we must look at the fact that it is not the b boys, not the little black boy with the plaques in his hair and his pants on his butt. He's not the one bringing the cocaine in. He's not the one bringing the guns in. You see? And so when there are consequences, and you pointed out very sharply that there's no consequences. I think uh, um, 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 Sean talked about the last 20 years, what high-value uh, drug dealer has been prosecuted. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen any. None. So this is where the problem has to be addressed from, and then the trickle-down will have an effect. There are other things I want to talk about, but I won't go into it here. Again, I appreciate um, the program this morning. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Sif. Always good hearing from you. We have a call on the line with us from Diggle Martin. Good morning, caller. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Shea, Mr. Small. Good morning. The gentleman, former mayor of Fort Spain, I, I interjected about a couple of months ago where he highlighted that he made a report to the police while at the National Lottery Board and nothing comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I think he wants to give this new incumbent an opportunity. It's all well good. I understand his opinion. But what I have seen with the incumbent for the last six months, to me as a citizen, is a failure, a miserable failure. For example, the police, for them to change, it must come from within. You cannot put somebody at the top and hope it to filter through. That is not how organizations fundamentally function. Until you get a leader to motivate everybody to change. Mm -hmm. And you have to change wholesomely, not only at the top, at the bottom. And it's a lot of hard work. Yes. For example, I want to basically put the police at the forefront of the problem we're seeing with the children's authority. This was in 2021. It was all over the media. The boys were calling out for help. Well, the, the police did. It was in social media. They gave an indication that they were abused. Were the police proactive? Mm -hmm. No. They're waiting for something to happen. And this is exactly what happened. They, they focus on corrective action and non preventive action. For example, the police service say protect and serve. And that is a mantra they're not faithful to at all. This is how we, we treat citizens as poor policemen. If they come into a line, they're given the opportunity to break the queue and be served first. So we, by our demeanor, respect them, but they don't respect us. They disrespect the citizens and have said, treat organization responsible for the decline. The judiciary, the police service, and sometimes a large part of it is the press. All right. Okay. One example I'm going to give you about the judiciary. Very, very quickly, There's please, Kolo. Now, quickly, mm -hmm. where there was a, a judgment on a former sports minister, a leading attorney in, in things. They had to go to court to get him to pay what the court thinks. So that's failure. Why, if the court gave you a judgment, why you had to go back to the court to get it? 
Yeah. I'll go and have a nice day. Have a nice day, Cola. Thank you. A uh, caller on the line with us from San Fernando. Good morning, Cola. Hey, gentlemen. Good morning. Hey, good morning. morning. Very long time. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have a question. Probably Mr. Lee Singh can, can take this. Mr. Lee Singh, um, do you think Trayon Tobago is ready to deal with the fallout of dealing with crime, and I say that in, in, in this context, Trinidad and Tobago has a parallel economy, which yeah. the last report that I had read some years ago said at the time it was about $50 billion, which was bigger than the national budget. And the fallout of dealing with that financial issue, as hard as people think Trinidad and Tobago is, if it is that money is taken out of the system, what's going to happen in this country? And as people in authority and the people throughout the value chain, do they understand what has been created by dependency on this money mm. and what's going to happen if this money is taken out of the, of, of the economy? And nobody is in, in authority want to deal with this. Yeah. Did you say, that is, did you that say is 50 matter. Did you say 50 million or 50 billion? 50 billion. 50 billion. billion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to answer this, but uh, call uh, we go. If, if that's any question, I'm just going to let them answer it off if that's okay with you. Yeah, no problem. Sure, right. sure. Thank you. you. Let's, so, take the, let's take the callers and then we, we, we get any questions. Is there anybody else with us on the line? All right. We have a caller on the line with us from Shugona. So, caller from San Fernando, your question is noted. It will be answered very shortly. Uh, but we have a caller on the line with us from Shugona. Good morning. Good morning. What I cannot understand about this abuse in children of home as a former public server, mm -hmm. one is required to just any problem while you see it. Even if there's an inquiry, you don't wait until the inquiry is done. And many of these actions that we are hearing was criminal in nature. Yes. Why were they not reported to the relevant authority? Mm -hmm. And that, in my opinion, is a question I hear nobody answer. Not one person. Yeah, you're, you're right, Professor. You're right. right. And the minister's job is to see that it is done. And that is what all our ministers are not doing, because if they were doing it, you, would have, you wouldn't have administrative reports seven years old. Well, right. any question? Well, question? no question, but Professor, I think this is the first time I completely agree with you. So well, about time. <laughs> but I see you are improving. <laughs> Have a good weekend, Professor. <laughs> Colin there with us from Diggle Martin. Good morning, Colin. Hi, good morning, you worthy gentlemen. Good morning, morning sir. Um, I just want to say that um, poverty in this country, really, being poor from young and growing up doesn't make you turn to the criminal activities. You, you see, installation of good teaching from parental guidance, that teaches you how to motivate your life into a certain direction. Mm -hmm. People that turn to crime and all that sort of thing is because of all the different factors. The, the, the first children must be understood to um, know what the value of a dollar is. And you see, the modern day society with the children are there. Everything they see, they feel that it comes easily, but they don't know how hard your parents have worked for it and, and you know, provided for them. Yes. And then the, the next point is that the, the drug trade in this country really started off seriously from 1990 after the coup. Or after that, this country was flourishing with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you all have not brought on Mr. Stichero to answer any questions pertaining to that. Because I am telling you, sir, I'm afraid of how to this. You're just going to put a good lady really into some problems. Mm -hmm. I, um, I used to live with parents. There was one next to me and one was just to me. And I tell you, it's not a nice thing to be living amongst. That's one of the reasons I move out of there. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact is that it's not normal boys in this thing. It's people of high, high ranking in the society. Yes. And a lot, of, a lot of us know it. We do. We are aware of it. And, and the fact is, look at, look at the other day when they found this shipment with the drugs, the cocaine and the guns in a, 
sovereign party only had with it. What became of that? You never hear anything after that. Nothing. What has become of that? Nothing. That tells you how this country has been run. Yeah. I've been saying it. My father was not a very rich person, but we work hard. And he achieved all what he achieved along my, with myself. Mm -hmm. And we work very hard. We paid all our taxes as people and paid taxes that nobody used to work in the market. And, and, and people in the market never used to pay taxes. Most of them, that's about two or three of us. And I used to pay income tax, but I used to pay a personal tax, he used to pay a personal tax. All of that, but my father did. Always wanted the correct thing in life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the minute you stay away from the correct thing, you're going to continue that along the lines of your life, and he never wanted us to run. Well, Kola, after... I up on the market. You have another caller. Kola, I... I have a bad word, of course, and I saw you probably did it, but you never did it for us. Well, Kola, I'm going to have to thank you very much for your call, and I'm going to have to cut you there because we have another call in line okay, with us. I appreciate the time and thanks for taking my call. Thank you very thank much. You, have, a good, have a good day, Kola. Good have a good you. weekend. We have a call in line with us uh, from Digo Martin. Good morning. Hi, guys, and Mr. Lee Singh. Mr. Lee Singh, good to see you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. morning guys, morning. I ranted on the abuse on Monday, so can we do real, three questions real fast? I hope Mr. Lee Singh doesn't mind. Go for it. Okay, cool. Quick. Keaton, this week you couldn't get over the quote on smiling by the acting commissioner. And Sean also quoted George Orwell. So we're going to do those real fast. Who said these words? Sure, there are dishonest men in local government, but there are dishonest men in national government too. Was it Faris, Watson, Duke, someone about John O'Halloran or Richard Nixon? I was going to guess Louis Lee Singh, but I guess I would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Someone about John O'Halloran. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong. It's Richard Nixon. Uh -huh. Okay. That's, okay. Yeah. Politics is the art by which politicians obtain campaign contributions from the rich, votes from the poor, on the pretext of protecting each from the other. Pande, Paul Mohammed Ghani, or the German American socialist Oscar Ameringa. I think it's the last one. I think I think it's the last one. I I, I mean Yeah, I... he was a organized a socialist movement and right. appointed a governor who was supposed to be I remember anti studying Ku Klux that. Klan, but he betrayed him, was impeached and that's when he yeah, made that comment yeah. which applies as you know. Politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and guess what? Applying the wrong remedies. Yeah. Was it the UNC women's group, Wade Mark, Groucho Mark? Or Ramesh Yosaran. I was going to say Winston Churchill, but I guess none of the options. Eh? <laughs> that sounds like Marx. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's Groucho Marx. Yeah. yeah. You gave us away two real all real local win. local answers except the one. Yeah, um, but that applies to us, right? So yes. My quote for everything today is "Too late, too late shall be the cry." Once more, Gober has hit the fan. Have a wonderful weekend, and you master control is always great. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right, uh, we, we had that question uh, from the caller from San Fernando. I, I don't know, Sean, if you want to go first, and then we give uh, uh, Mr. Lee Singh the opportunity. Well, I, I'll try and be quick. My thing is, ultimately, if, if we are dependent on drug money, if it props up the economy or the private sector in some way, my only thing is that's an unnatural equilibrium to our economy. And the caller alluded to that. We, we, you know, if we have some dependency on that, this it's is gonna why, take growing pains. This is why, but I we asked. need we need to divest ourselves from it because that is not sustainable. This is why I asked whether or not because getting rid of the drug trade or erasing it without the drug trade the question, would our economy here's, collapse. Here's the question: How much is it costing us? Right, crime costs society. Crime is a negative drain on revenue of society, so on me, productivity let me, of society. Let me, let, me take, let me try and do it as succinctly as I could. That 50 billion of which he speaks is hearsay. Because the drugs, the bulk of the drugs that come to Trinidad really leave Trinidad. And the money flows through. The money flows through. Let me put, point out, however, that we are yet to quantify what crime really costs this country. Trinidad and Tobago must be one of the few places in the world where national security, i.e. police, i.e. crime, i.e. criminal activity, enjoys the biggest chunk of the budget. And when one contemplates that it is not only the line item assigned to national security 
that is that is 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 paid for by we the taxpayer because of crime when you go to the hospital the number of people who come there with bullet wounds and chops and and what have you it's a tremendous cost and burden to the country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a time when I went to school in this country, there were no security guards at the gate. Now we have security guards 24-7 in every school. That is crime. We have guards at every hospital. That didn't used to be the case. We have guards in the church now. That isn't, never used to be yeah. the case. Yep. And I'm saying to you, the crime in this country is it's our biggest burden. And I would love to hear a prime minister come and say, gentlemen, regardless of what happens, 2022 would be the year of the eradication of crime. All hands must be on deck. This is not a time to look away. This is a time to look at and report. Fighting crime and fixing crime in Trinidad and Tobago is not an assignment for police who are certainly not organized to do it. Fighting crime and, and, and dealing with it in all manifestations is something that must happen in the churches, in the schools, in the villages, in the communities. We must call to bear arms from every pair of eyes, feet, everybody in this country to make it work. Let me also say to you that we must also have the political will to deal with those people at the top, to deal with all those people who say they are community leaders. We've got to return life to the citizens of this country. The citizens of this country are paying taxes for a non-life. And until the politicians in this country, and I mean them all, especially the aspiring ones who have now put their names up, I hope they can stand the scrutiny of whether they are worthy to hold any serious office. We cannot continue to play footsie with a fundamental, which is to say, the criminals in the society, we must stop them once and for all. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, and that is where we will conclude today's program. I want to thank uh, the uh, former mayor of Portis Bay, Louis Lee Singh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we will welcome you to the program once more. Um, hopefully for an entire program. Um, Karen Yosichera was unable to join us today, um, but hopefully we will see her next week. And uh, we we are deliberately refraining from the from the situation uh, arising out of the PNM and Women's League uh, for reasons of which we will state at a later time. But for now, uh, Mr. Shaw Michael Small, thank you very much as well uh, for your contribution to the program as always, and to all our callers as well. Uh, we have just about a minute left. Closing remarks, gentlemen. Yeah, I just want to talk about North Coast Jazz. Please, go for it. I merely want to say to people, despite all the glitz and the glamour of North Coast Jazz, it is founded in a very important principle. Uh, we set about years ago to establish a destination in Blanchichez called Blanchichez. We saw, that is the community council and ourselves, working together that Blanchichet has all the attributes to be a good destination. And we thought that we would establish a festival which would help to drive that. How successful we have been? In the first year of the program, we reached out to the community and we got 21 rooms, bed and breakfast rooms. In the last year when we held the, the event, we had 67 rooms. This year, the event is not yet here, but 100 plus rooms have all gone from the community and the surrounding communities. So that we are excited that there has been that response. And I merely want to say to people who are out there who continue to ask about North Coast Jazz, it is the only feel good experience that you will get in Trinidad and Tobago. When I say feel good, I mean feel good. I, we invite you on behalf of the community and the North Coast Jazz Committee to come along and have the time of your life. When you leave there, you will always want to come back to the washerwoman. The washerwoman is really Blanche Shares, the English of Blanche Shares. 
so that when you leave there, you always want to come back to the washerwoman. <laughs> Okay. Well, folks, you can look out for North Coast Jazz. Uh, look out for your tickets They're available at all Extra Foods locations, Crosby's in St. James, uh, Digital Trinity, and at their headquarters on Marvel Road, as well as WSN at 38 Gattaca Street. Uh, folks, Sean and I, yes, I'm speaking on behalf of Sean, now, we will be there. We will be enjoying the festivities. We will be in Blanchichers. He's looking surprised. Yeah, it was supposed to be a surprise. We, yeah. we, we will? It was supposed to be a surprise. I wasn't, oh. I wasn't going to tell him on, until near oh. the time because he's the one that's driving. I'll take it, I'll take it in email? Yeah, he was going to drive to Blanchichers, but, you know, I think we might ride it. We're going to do an episode from Blanchichers, we, North Coast well, we Possibly. We North might Coast. ride in style. We might ride in style. <laughs> anyway, folks, that's it for Talking Point. Have a great weekend. And as always, today is a good day to have a good day, as ironic as it may be, but it's also a good day to start a great weekend. And we'll see you again on Monday morning, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>